Hi everyone, it's great to have the opportunity to speak with you all today. Uh, my name is Nick Hamilton, I head up our lab automation Automata, Automata uh, which is an automation company and you'll hear a bit more from uh, my colleague later who heads up the commercial side of our lab automation team. Automata, like myself, didn't come focused on lab life sciences when we first started out. We, we started from a place of trying to solve a problem, not in labs, but a problem in automation as a whole. What we found was that when we put our first product to market, which was Eva Robot, which you can see on my left and my right, which is the most affordable industrial robot arm on the market. When we, when we launched that two and a half years ago, what we saw was a huge demand from lab automation. And I think a massive reason for that demand is everything that we've seen over COVID period. I think what we've all witnessed is this incredible tragedy that's happened across the globe. But from a personal point of view as someone in automation, what I felt is a sense of failure. This massive sense of failure in the inability of automation to react in the way that everyone would want and hope in a crisis like that. What we've seen is that in this crisis, people have in their, in the, for the far most flexibility and the quickest result that turns people to do incredibly repetitive tasks rather than to automation. And when I say people, what I'm talking about so often is eminent scientists, eminent doctors, eminent professors being called out their all important day jobs in order to do incredibly repetitive tasks. And so many of them have volunteered to do this and they have been celebrated across the world and that is absolutely right. They should have been. But like I say, all that gives me is also a sense of saving. Because why was the automation there to mean that they could carry on with those important jobs that involved their in a huge amount of experience and expertise rather than being pulled into jobs that did. In the UK, they set, we set up a load of uh, COVID testing facilities to respond to that. And this happened across the world. But one of those facilities started doing this blog, which was a meet the team blog. And the reason I want to share one of the slide, this slide and this extract from it is because it was the best summary of that emotion that I felt and why I was feeling. What we have is some is this scientist, Dr. Stone Elworthy, who had 28 years experience in immunity and cardiovascular disease. Pretty important in a time like COVID to realise those are some pretty important things to continue focusing. And yet, Dr. Stonelworthy gave up focusing on that research in order to volunteer at this testing lab. So what did those 28 years boil down to? What, what was the thing that he could do that no one else could? Well, that thing was to take a sample, to spat barcode scan it, and to protect from that sample into a plate. And what was the expertise he was bringing? The ability to to, to identify a 96 fold plate and the ability to use a protect. It doesn't seem like the right criteria to pull someone like Dr. Stone Elworthy off what he was doing before to help. And it doesn't sound like the sort of thing that people do that thousands of times a day times a day are ever going to be the right people to solve that problem. But it didn't surprise me that everyone went this way. Because somehow we've ended up in this space where we have robots that can do parkour. We've got robots that the year before produced 91 million cars. And we've got robots in response to COVID can now give a tattoo remote. And yet we don't have robots or automation is not seen as a fast enough tool to solve those, the 
the kind of job that Dr. Sonell Worthy was brought into. And that speaks a lot to the heritage of automation. It speaks a lot to where automation came from, which is this place where it costs hundreds of millions of dollars to set up a bespoke facility for you. For you. It takes years to develop that, and it's developed by experts, for experts, and maintained by experts. And automation came from a place of doing things that people can't, not what people should so automation is inherently failing in its aim of allowing humans to be more human. Instead, so instead we pull on people like Dr. Stone Elworthy to come in and solve that. And that's why we end up in this place where in a lab you're so much more likely to hear the, the phrase RSI than you are AI. But this isn't just a problem that has happened because of coronavirus. All that's happened is that coronavirus has shone a light on the cracks that are already in place. Because Dr. Stone Elworthy is going to go back to his research lab and he's going to have the same problems. He's going to find that 70% of the time his peers can't replicate his results. And what's worse, 50% of the time he can't replicate his own results. And it comes back to that line, allow humans to be more human. Humans are inherently bad at doing stuff incredibly repetitively. And that is a great thing. But we have to make sure that automation can do those things for us. So we find ourselves in this weird space, this space where media and public perception is one where automation can do everything. Automation is taking over for better or for worse, depending on your point of view. But the truth and the reality is that we have these brilliant scientists sat doing incredibly repetitive, incredibly mundane results to achieve amazing goals for humanity. And it's a waste. It's a waste of that intelligence of those people. It is a waste of businesses' resources, and it is a waste of the technology that is available now and is becoming rapidly more and more available over the next few years. But automation still needs to go further. And the way that we see it in automata, there are three main problems that we have to solve. One is the affordability of programs. You shouldn't need hundreds of millions of dollars to set up to start engaging with automation and getting benefit from it. The second is accessibility. You shouldn't need to depend on an expert who is going to come in and tell you it has to be this way, that is the way it is, it's completely fixed and go this way or it won't work. You should be able to leverage that yourself. And it should be flexible enough that when your business priorities inevitably change in six months' time, or some crisis happens like the one we've just seen, people feel confident and safe reaching for automation rather than reaching for what they've tried and tested, which is overqualified, overintelligent people being used for repetitive mundane tasks. At Automata, we've had the pleasure of being involved in setting up a fully automated test, COVID testing facility uh, as part of the UK national effort to increase that testing capacity. And it's been an amazing, amazing experience. It's been amazing to watch how motivated, empowered, driven the team uh, Automata have been about solving this problem and it's completely understandable why, right? right? We've all felt the pain. But it has also been incredible to watch the way that that automata team has been able to react to the problems and the changes that have happened in that project. What we've watched so much is, industri is incumbents in this industrial space develop something overly bespoke, offer something overly bespoke, only for the science around the tests we're processing to change, because those are being developed at the same time. And that whole system has to be rewrote or no longer work. 
And instead, by being able to use modern technology, instead by being able to use modern techniques and approaches to technology, we've been able to solve that and react to those changing needs because it isn't right that an automation company should say you have to get everything completely fixed, everything answered to me before I can come and do it. You should be able to work hand in hand, engineers and scientists solving the problems together and having a mutual understanding of the challenges. Yeah. I'd love to tell you more about this project, and I'm sure that I will soon at the moment we can't. But um, as I said, it will be it will be great when when we can. What I do want to focus on, though, is to talk about if you're looking to have on how you can get benefit out of automation, where you should be looking. And so often we talk about automation in this high throughput line type of analogy, the one that's most similar, of course, to car production, most similar to drug production. But that isn't the only place, and that certainly often isn't the most beneficial place most organizations can get it. Right at the other end of the spectrum, far more simple but often the most beneficial, is this idea of automated decision. That that workstation, that task that people are doing day in, day out, and you've got that person just stood there doing some repetitive, mundane tasks. That's a great place to start. And if you approach it in the right way, then what's great is that you might start, for example, by automating a liquid handler. But very quickly, you can add in that an incubator, a reader, and suddenly you can automate the entire process, the entire assay, the entire experiment. And that's what we want to talk to you about. Is if you're going and looking how how into automation, how should you how should you appraise that? How should you start? And the fact is you should start simple. Always try and focus it down to the simplest thing that will give you the most benefit quickly. But make sure you build around flexible products. Make sure you build around the kind of technology that is going to be able to enable you to then do the next step and the next step and gain more and more benefit. Because if you take all industrial approaches to automation, you're going to build something so bespoke for what you've just conceptualized as your need now. In six months' time, you're going to have to go through that all over again in order to change that system to meet that. And that goes hand in hand with picking your partner. Automation isn't a place where unless you really have that expertise within your company, you're probably going to need support. But make sure you pick the right partner to support you. So often in automation, the number of years that that company has been around automating stuff is actually quite a bad reflection of whether they're the right partner to go. So often they're taking old-fashioned, old-style, old-technology approach to a problem that makes it expensive, slow, and inflexible. So make sure that you go with a company that is adopting new technology. Make sure you go with a company that makes this simple for you, that feels like you are part of that process, and they're not just putting it forward. And make sure you go to someone where they're invested in getting into success, not just charging you a day rate. There's loads more to say about this, and I hope that this speech will start to get you interested in what you can do. And if it is, then please go and read our uh, Beginner's Guide to Lab Automation. It's there for people like you, it's there to give you an overview of the things that you should start thinking about, the way you should start to assess opportunities. It's on our website. We might be able to send a link out afterwards, so I'll, I'll try and get that sent to you. But please read it. And more importantly, please talk to us. We're always happy to listen to what you're trying to do. We're always happy to tell you if it's something we can help with, or if it's not, if there's a partner that can help you with it. And in the occasional situation, tell you that maybe your idea is a bit crazy and let's start with something else instead. What I want to do now is hand over to Craig, who I introduced at the start. Craig's going to give you a demo of a system we developed. 
And the purpose of this demo is to give you, um, purpose of that demo is to give you a sense of the technology that's coming, the technology, what to expect from automation on those three things we talked about, that affordability, that accessibility, and flexibility. Because it's only as customers, only if people in industry start expecting more of the automation industry, that we'll truly start to see the change that we all want to see and that improvement. So I get to do the fun bit of the webinar today, and that's take what Nick has been talking about in the abstract sense or, or through some stories or research and show you what the next wave of lab automation is going to look like in a practical sense. Uh, before I do, uh, we are recording this in advance, uh, mainly because I'm running on a three camera setup. So I've got one here, one over there, and one on the far sides. And I'm recording my screen as well to show you some software. And I've done enough Zooms over the past year to know live streaming that would be absolute chaos. Uh, so we're recording this morning of, uh, but I'll jump back in afterwards with Nick to answer some questions. Um, so I'm Craig, uh, I am the writer, producer, director for this bit, uh, but more commonly I am the commercial lead at Automata for lab automation. And what that means is I get to spend my days talking to uh, people in labs in a range of industries. Uh, so in pathology, in university research groups, in tiny little biotech startups or in massive corporate pharma organizations. And I get to do a really exciting thing, which is change their perspective on what lab automation can be. I'm moving them from this place of thinking of lab automation as this um, massively costly, inaccessible, unflexible thing uh, to something exciting, vibrant and new. Um, it's a really great job, I really enjoy it. Um, so if Nick's done his job right, we should be about halfway through the session today, so that leaves me about 15 minutes to run you through a practical demo um, of some lab automation setup. We've got a range of equipment here uh, from a range of different providers. I'll run you through it in just a minute. Um, but 15 minutes is not long, um, but what we're going to do is show you how much you can achieve in just that 15 minutes, maybe even less. Uh, it depends on how long I'm waffling on for. Um, and really give you an idea of what is possible in lab automation. And that's what we want to leave you with today. It's not a sense that um, our automata robot is amazing and incredible and you should buy loads. Um, I mean, I would love for that to happen. Uh, but what I want to do today is leave you with a little bit of inspiration. And that's inspiration to go back to your lab um, and look at your processes with a new set of eyes. Um, and that's starting to think about what could be possible with this next wave of lab automation. So looking at your uh, lab processes, the assays that you're running, what steps are the most boring, what steps can we cut out, where can we utilize your highly capable, highly trained people bet in better places than doing highly monotonous tasks. And that's the one thing I want to leave you with at the end of this 15 minutes. Uh, so without further ado, I am going to kick off our demo and show you the next wave of affordable, accessible, and flexible lab automation. And the easiest one to start with is affordable. Uh, so let's go over here uh, to my lab automation setup. So this is the setup that we're going to demo today. Uh, and we've got a few different bits of equipment here uh, from a few different providers. So uh, here we have the OT2 liquid handler from Opentrons. Uh, Opentrons very much being one of the pioneers of this move for affordable, accessible lab uh, automation. We have a stand here from Vention, um, just to put these two on. We've got a standard lab bench, a microplate here, which you're very familiar with. And for that microplate, we have a microplate gripper, uh, the gripper itself being from a German company called Zimmer. And then we've just made some custom metal fingers uh, that work for a standard microplate setup. And then what we have here is the glue that is going to hold this automation system together. Uh, and that is the EVA robot from Automata, and that's what we're going to focus on today. Before I do, I said the first thing I was going to talk about was affordability. So when we look at the system as a whole, uh, we are talking less than $20,000, which is quite incredible for the world of lab automation. Traditionally, you know, you're thinking of a starting price at six figures, and you're going up from there. So to have, so to have all of this, uh, the potential for a fully automated system uh, at around $20,000 um, is, is really massive cost savings there. Um, when you think about the comparable throughput, the higher degree of flexibility, and that uh, minimum extra 80k, which I'm sure you could allocate to many, many exciting things that you want to do in your lab. Um, so when we talk affordability, this system has it. 
We'll focus then, uh, as I said, on the EVA robot, uh, the glue in this automation system. So I'm going to pull the robot around here. Um, so EVA is a six-axis industrial robot. Um, so it has six joints. We have joint one down here, which is the big rotational joint. We have two and three here, which is your lean forward and lean back joints. We have joint four here, which is just like your forearm, it's a rotational joint, uh, so they can go in and around like that. We have axis five here, which is very much the rest of the robot, so it's an up and down movement just there. And then we have axis six, which is your final rotational axis here. And those six axes give you six degrees of freedom, uh, which gives you uh, ultimate flexibility in automating your assay. Uh, so that makes it easy to move things from different levels, say from a lower lab bench up to the bed of the open trons here. It helps you manipulate in and around microplate readers um, if they have cartridges coming out. Um, it just gives you that ease of movement to get in and around everything that you kind of want to automate around. And to control the EVA robot, we have a piece of software called Choreograph. Yeah. So we have two buttons on the front of the robot here. And this is the first one that we're going to use, and it's the back driving button. Now, the back driving button, when I press it, it releases the brakes on all the joints here. Yeah, and that gives me ultimate control of the robot, and that means I can drag it and drop it into any position that I need it in. The robot itself has a reach of 600 millimeters, so I can come 600 mil out from the base. You can see it coming right around there. And that's around the length of a human arm, yeah, so anything that a human can reach, the robot can reach. And what you see in Choreograph is when I move it around there, uh, the live robot and Choreograph fall in those positions around. So you always have an idea of where your robot is in space in Choreograph. Uh, now I've got the second button here, which is to set a waypoint, um, and that saves those positions that we move the robot into. Uh, and that means we can start to build a toolpath from the points that we save along the way. So what we're going to do today is automate a really, really simple process, which is loading this microplate into one of the bays in the open trunks. Uh, we've got a little reservoir with some reagent that we're just going to pipette into a couple of the, um, couple the slots on the microplate. And uh, from there, we'll unload the microplate right back to where we started. I'll just show you that really, really simple process that you can start to think, how would this apply to me and how would this apply to my lab? So let's get started by um, picking up the microplate. So you can see here in Choreograph, I have no points saved. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to back drive the robot into position to pick up that first microplate. So we have back driving. We're going to come right down to here. And then we're going to save that point using the save waypoint button. So what you can see now is the virtual robot has moved into the position of the physical robot. And if I click here, you can see we have point one saved there, uh, hovering over the microplate. And there's a couple of things we need to do to point one before we can pick up that microplate. And the first is to level the head of the robot. Um, and we do that really simply by right clicking here and you saw the robot adjust there. And what that does is allow us to pick up a range of different uh, lab wares from a flat surface. So Petri dishes uh, or microplates, it makes it really easy to get an even hold on them. Uh, and now instead of back driving the robot again, uh, all I need to do is make a movement straight down to pick up that microplate. Um, so I'm not gonna do that physically, I'm gonna do that within the software. Uh, and I'm gonna use two functions to achieve that. The first is the clone button here. So we turn point one into point two. And then we're gonna use the absolute movement function. Uh, now, if I take a look, uh, the robot looks to be about 40 mil above where it needs to be. So I am going to bring this down from 205.8 to 165. I'm gonna move that down. And you'll see in the software, it's created point two there, 40 mil down from point one. And because that we're just moving through one axis, it's gonna be a straight movement right down onto the sides of that microplate. So all I'm gonna do now is hit send to, to move the robot there in real life, and we'll see how we get on. And if we take a look at that now, I can see that's slightly too high for me. 
So what we're going to do is just send that down a few more mil, about five mil, let's say. So now that we've set our waypoints, we're going to do our first bit of robotic programming. And to do that, I'm just going to pull up the timeline at the bottom here. And what we need to do is drag and drop our waypoints onto that timeline to create a toolpath. And the robot will work through that toolpath sequentially each step in order. Uh, so we're going to start at point one, the point above the microplate. We are then going to move down to point two, which is the point at which we pick up the microplate. And then we're going to go back to point one. And when we're at point two, and when we're at point two, we need to close the jaws of the gripper. So to do that, I'm going to set some outputs on the end effector IO of the robot, which is uh, wired to the gripper that we have. Uh, so I'm going to set end effector digital one to zero. And I'm going to set end effector digital two to one. And all it's going to do is send two digital signals and uh, instruct the gripper to close its jaws. So whenever we pick something up, it's always good practice to put a weight in. And that's just going to be of zero point two seconds there. Now the last thing that we're going to do is make sure that at the start of every toolpath, our gripper jaws are open. So, so all I'm going to do is basically set the reverse of what I've set here at the start of the toolpath. So in fetch our digital one to zero, or one to one even and end effect or digital two to zero. And that means every time we start, the gripper's in the right position for us to pick up that microplate. All we need to do now is upload that tool past the robot, hit home to go to the first position, and then hit play. So now that we've picked the microplate up, what we're gonna do is program it to move around, over, and into the open tronge. So I'm just going to do what I did earlier with the back driving, which is press down that button here. Uh, and we're going to guide it with two hands, so I want it to make these an active movements. So we're going to bring it right back up in here. And I'm going to save that part. And then we're going to rotate it right over here. And we're going to save that point as well. Uh, and that means that uh, the robot isn't going to swing around and go right in. We've got a safe trajectory into the machine. And as you can see there in choreograph, uh, the robot now, uh, nice and upright, ready to move in. So when we're putting the microplate in, we're almost going to do the exact opposite of what we did earlier. So earlier we hovered over the microplate and then we moved down to pick it up. Whereas this time, all we're going to do is we're going to move the microplate right into position. So press right against the base, like that. And then we're going to save that waypoint. And then in choreograph, all we're going to do is duplicate that waypoint and move it up by that 40 mil we moved it up by earlier. So it's around this position. And that means we can get that straight vertical pickup and we won't catch any of the lab wire in there. Uh, so what I'm gonna do now is jump into choreograph, do that little duplication. So that's my first bit of editing trickery. I've just uh, duplicated that point like I did earlier. Um, but we started, I guess, eight minutes ago now and we've got all the building blocks that we need to program our full toolpath. So now we're gonna program it all the way through. We've got that first pickup started and from point one, once we picked up the microplate, we want to go to point three and then we want to go around to point four. We then want to go to the point above the microplate deck, which is the point we cloned, point six. We go down to point five and back up to point six. And again, at point five, we want to put down the microplate. So I'm going to do exactly what I did at the start and add two outputs to put it down. It's a one zero again. So hopefully you're starting to get a picture of how straightforward this would be for you to program yourself. Uh, and indeed how easy it would be to make changes in the future. 
Um, so if you were looking to say, um, you know, change the position in the open trons that you'd load it into, all you need to do is change points six and five, and the rest of the toolpath is exactly the same. We saw how quick it was to program in those waypoints earlier. Uh, the last thing that we need to add is a signal to the OpenTrons to start the liquid handling protocol that we've preloaded onto it. I've connected them via a digital wire again. So all we need to do is send a uh, signal this time on the base digital IO. And we're going to send a one along that. And all that's going to do is trigger the OpenTrons to start. And then we're going to head back up to four to make sure we're out of the way when it kicks off. Um, so now the only thing I need to do is program the micro plate unloading from the OpenTrons. And uh, really simple, we've got all the uh, points already. Uh, so we're just going to program what we've programmed there in reverse. Um, and there's one change that I need to make, and that's that we're waiting for a signal from the OpenTrons this time. So I'm going to load it in on an if branch, and that branch is conditional on getting a digital signal from the OpenTrons. I can move this out of the way. So we'll go input this time on base digital two. That'll be a one again. And when we get that signal back from the OpenTrons, uh, we're going to kick off the unloading process. Uh, it's going to be a bit boring to see me do the reverse, uh, so I'll do my second and final bit of editing trickery and uh, put the rest in before we kick things off. Okay, so now we're going to demonstrate that full toolpath that we just programmed uh, running as is. So I'm going to hit go on our software. Uh, you'll see the robot coming down there to pick up the microplate and the OpenTrons homing at the same time. Uh, so once we place that microplate into the um, bay that we put it in, it's going to trigger the OpenTrons to go and start pipetting. Uh, and we've just done a really basic uh, two cycles of pipetting. We don't want it to run through the full 96. It's going to be quite boring for you all. Uh, so that's just pipetting down into the first hole. And then you'll see the OpenTrons run through that second pipetting motion. Uh, just about now. There we go. So once that's done, uh, all it's going to do is communicate back to the robot that's ready to come in. It's ready to pick up the microplate and place it back down on the table where we uh, picked it up from before. So it's dispensed the pipettes it pairs, communicating back to the robot. And here we go in. And nice and simple, there we go, right back to where we started. So there we have it, a really, really simple demo there, but it should start to give you an idea of what is going to be possible in the next wave of lab automation. You saw how easy the software was to use, you saw how easy the robot was to, to move and to program, um, and if my little six-year-old nephew can do it with his shock of ginger hair and his aggressive Scottish accent, and uh, no industrial automation experience at all, then you can do it too. Um, as we say, that's a really, really dead simple demo. It's a single microplate into a single deck on a liquid handler. But when you start to think thereafter, that's where things get really, really exciting. So instead of a single microplate, imagine we've got a microplate hotel there uh, and we can uh, load in 24 microplates or 44 microplates. Um, and you can set it up at 5 p.m. It will load them all through the night and you come in at 8 a.m. the next day and your experiments are ready to run and you've saved a whole load of time. Maybe instead of a plate hotel, we have a microplate reader and you can start to think about automating a full asset. Uh, indeed, I was speaking to a customer just yesterday um, and they wanted to automate the reading of microplates. Uh, and they could do that two ways. They could spend uh, six figures, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of pounds on a expensive computational microplate reader, or they could buy a robot, an incubator, and a basic microplate reader and they could string them all together for less than 30 k That's a huge cost saving, um, and it also gives them much more flexibility to change that experiment in the future, to react to the discoveries that they make. Um, and that's where things, as I say, get really, really exciting in this industry. As I said at the top, all I wanted to leave you with today was a little bit of inspiration. Um, so I'd love for you in the next few days to go back into your labs, to take a look at those new processes, and think about what you can do with this new wave of affordable, accessible, and flexible automation. 
If you want any support in doing that, please reach out to us. Um, we'll jump into the questions in just a bit. Um, I think it's about four hours time for me. It's probably about five minutes time for you. Um, we'll leave my contact details at the end. And maybe even if you're not looking for a six axis robot, we're well connected in this field. Uh, and we can maybe connect you to some of the right providers. We're really part of the start of a growing movement here. There's other people like uh, Opentrons or Flow Robotics or Automata who are leading the charge on this next wave of lab automation. And we can make sure that you speak to the right people in those companies. Um, so thank you very much for sticking with me today through, uh, and I hope you enjoyed the demo. Uh, and as I say, we'll be back very soon to answer any of your questions. Uh, so thanks for your time and uh, back over live to Nick. Cheers. Hopefully that um, demo gave you a bit of a flavour of what we're talking about and a bit of an insight into what you should be looking for and expecting. And Craig has now joined me and we're going to do some questions in a bit. But before we get into that, there's a couple of final things that I want to say. The first is um, our uh, team have written a great insights report on lab automation. We wrote this uh, for all of our customers and the people on our newsletter to give them a bit more of an overview of the lab automation space, the technology that's there, what processes coming through. So if this talk has in any way sparked some interest, give that a read. There's some, some really great insight in there. And uh, again, we'll send that out in an email after this so you should get um, easy access to it. But, but if not, you can go onto our website and it's there. Um, I think. Before we move on to questions, the thing that I want to do though is go back to a slide that I shared earlier where I talked about this, this imbalance between the perception of where automation is versus the reality and that reality being a place where we have scientists doing incredibly mundane repetitive tasks and then struggling with the reproducibility of their results, whether that's in pathology, whether that's in research or whether that's in uh, production environments. And what I hope is that the next time we speak to you in a year or two years time, we can move away from this slide and instead talk about this one and start to say that that space of those brilliant scientists doing such mundane repetitive tasks is something that is history. And where we are instead reflects far more what Craig just demo to you. That is what we picture when we think for lab. And at that point, I hope we can really start to have the exciting conversation about where lab, where automation in labs can take us and where we can go. I'll leave it there and we'll now move on to some, some questions. Um, I think we've been sent a few through, so I'm going to check this up. And I guess I'll be I'll be questioning. <laughs> Sounds good to me. All right. And then uh, okay. So yeah, first question we've got here are what are common applications that you deploy? Yeah, I guess you talked about it earlier, and they tend to fit into three categories most probably. Yeah. So uh, one will be our robot sat in front of a single bit of equipment, quite like the liquid handler that we showed earlier, and it's tending that machine. It's loading in microplates. It's loading in vials. Your, your kind of standard lab where there. Um, it's just replacing uh, that person who would otherwise have to either stand in front of that and load in uh, very simple stuff all day um, or um, free them up to go and do other things that they're better placed to go and do. So that's the first thing we tend to do very simply is to sit in front of a, a single piece of lab equipment and load in the lab where. Um, the second thing is starting to think about automating uh, part of or indeed a full battery. Um, a good example would be Eliza. Um, so there we'd be working with a, a liquid handler and then a microplate washer uh, alongside that. So loading from the plate washer into the microplate, um, into the liquid handler even. And then thereafter, you could even think about adding a microplate reader or maybe you need an incubator thereafter. Mm -hmm. And we start to build out from that one piece of equipment to multiple pieces of equipment. And we have that full assay end to end. Uh, and the last one to talk about is those uh, higher throughput situations, the likes of the COVID testing stuff that we talked about, um, that we are um, that you would expect from more traditional automation, but 
we're turning around on much quicker timelines with much more flexibility baked in. Um, so applications that we do tend to fit into those sorts of three things. And if you've got something in mind, uh, maybe it fits into those categories, maybe it doesn't, uh, drop us a line and let us know. We're always happy to review videos and take a look at things and, and just be generally helpful. Even if our robot can do it, we're, we're quite well connected. Yeah, I think, I think that's great. The only bit I'd add is I think, uh, I guess, the big difference between the stance that we take versus a lot of people that produce a robotic arm is that we very much um, want to support and own that solution for our customers to make sure that you get success. I think what we see is that, like I talked about so often, you need a partner, and um, what we want to do is make sure that in lots of ways we can be that partner to help you get success, or if at that point we have a different partner that we work with who we think is better placed, maybe location-wise or capability-wise to support you, then we do that. But our big focus is less about the robotic arm, which is a massive tool in, in what we can do, and more about getting getting any customer to success and therefore providing that solution. Um, okay, so question two is, do you partner with other lab equipment manufacturers? Uh, short answer, yes. Um, the longer answer, I guess you saw the open drums earlier. They're one of a, a quite, quite growing list of, of lab equipment manufacturers that we are integrating with. Um, there's a few more in this room that are scattered around the background mm -hmm. in various elements of development. So um, yeah, we're always really excited to add to that list as well. So if you've got something in mind, let us know. Um, the robot has been built on an API, which makes integrating with all these other bits of labware uh, quite straightforward. We often write the software integration ourselves to, to make it as easy as possible for our customers. Um, so yeah, we work with a range of stuff. We've talked about liquid handlers, plate readers, plate washers. Uh, we're uh, working with incubators, um, plate hotels, just really any kind of standard lab equipment you uh, can think of. Um, we're probably uh, either already integrating with it or ready to integrate with it. Um, so yeah, we, we very commonly partner with these sorts of companies uh, and always looking for more. Yeah, I think great. And that, that's exactly when we speak to flexibility, that's exactly what we mean. That ease of then adding on another bit of kit, another bit of kit, so that it suddenly doing a new application, a new solution is exactly what we want to enable people to do because we appreciate things change. Okay, and then I guess the response with it, and maybe you've already answered it, how easy is it to integrate your equipment with other standard lab equipment? So maybe you can talk to that a little bit more. Yeah, sure. So as I said there, it's built on an API, which is less common in industrial automation, but, but much more common in the lab world. And what we like to think about here is we can turn uh, you know, software engineers or people from a software background into into automation innovators, into people who can uh, code this stuff. Um, so we're built on that API, which makes the connection really easy. And then the robot itself, you saw how easy that was to program out there with that drag and drop functionality, uh, making the movements around it, loading stuff in and out, really, really straightforward. Um, so, so yeah, it's something that we made from the outset from our robot and making it really easy to do this stuff. Um, and we found that that's translated really well into the lab world. Um, as Nick said, we tend to like to um, approach it from a solution first perspective. So, so we want to uh, give you as much help, as much support in getting the solution up and running. Uh, but the ease of programming means that once you've got it in there, it's, it's really the flexibility that that brings that is the big advantage for, for lab technicians. So you can change that process, you can add extra things. So yeah, ease of use is something that, that we care a lot about. Um, and it's something that we've done to, to make it flexible and reactive to, to your needs scientifically. Yeah, I think I'll add to that. The other question we get asked quite a lot is, do you integrate with Lean systems? That can, might, be, might be somewhere in the, the back of your questions, but um, the answer is yes. Again, the same reason, it's all about the, the API. So basically, we're built on modern technology and therefore um, it makes it fairly simple to, to integrate with data capture. For that sort of thing. Um, I'm going to throw one final question out there and then we'll call it there. So, the question is within lab automation, which markets do you see most growth and most, um, most like uh, demand coming from? Yeah, we're really excited about a lot of different places in uh, lab automation. So, we're seeing lots of exciting stuff coming through from the tech industry. So, testing, inspection, compliance. Um, there's uh, a lot going on in university research labs and biotech. 
Uh, maybe the one that I'm most excited about is pathology. Um, obviously, a uh, very hot topic at the moment, you, you all know why. Um, but we're seeing a real need there uh, from both public bodies and from private bodies for automation, which we've sort of discussed today, that flexible, um, robust automation, which can come in and work really quickly and work within, really importantly, right now, a, 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 an industry that's changing rapidly mm. and that is reacting to um, uh, a situation that, that's, that's changing day by day or, or week by week. So um, that's where I'm really excited about it. That's where we're seeing a lot of growth is, is within pathology. Particularly within that, we're talking, um, I guess, microbiology. So the um, COVID testing that we've been doing. Uh, and also we're seeing lots of exciting stuff come in through genomics, uh, so through genome sequencing. Uh, lots of interesting uh, both applications there from a scientific perspective, but also from an automation perspective. Yeah. Um, so I'm super excited about pathology, uh, but as always, there's um, lots of other stuff that's coming in, and um, I'm sure my colleagues would, would probably have a different answer on that. But for me personally, uh, big pathology now. Yeah, I think that's that. I think it's that uh, mixture of like the intense need. I think we pride ourselves on our ability to react quickly um, and develop stuff faster than anyone else. So I guess it kind of fits with what we believe we offer or what we I hope should. Our customers feel we've shown we've offer. Um, yeah, and that's where I guess it's the most exciting because it's, it challenges you and tests you. Definitely. No, the team is that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I think that's it. I think that's all we've got time for. Um, thank you very much for watching. Um, I guess the final thing to say as we wrap up, which we've said a few times, is if you're thinking about going on this journey, if you've had bad experiences before and want to. Um, uh, a second crack at it, whatever, whatever you see, just talk to us. We're, we're always happy to advise. We really want all our customers to get success. So we're not, we're very much incentivized to make sure that if, uh, if it's not the right thing, then we'll tell you. And if it is, we'll either support you or find someone who can. Um, so thank you for watching. I hope you feel you've learned something. Um, and yeah, hope to talk to you soon. Thank you very much, folks. Speak soon.